there. So I, I just find, I'm going to put on a very short film. Some of you would have seen it before, but I just find it puts me, and I hope you, in a place where we move to a much more international sphere and, and based on the realities. And this is a film by WaterAid, one of our really important partners who are huge champions uh, of midwifery. So I'm just going to pop the film on um, and hopefully uh, it will come up. And I'm looking, yes? side of the screen is Uganda. Just, you know, in terms of fortitude, resilience, courage, um, it's tough for us here in the UK sometimes, but my goodness, you look at what the midwives are having to do. And Uganda's in quite a good place compared to some countries. Um, so, you know, I, I think when, when we talk about where we're going in 2020, it's, it's getting down to some very aspirational things, to getting the toilets functioning so that women don't go through labour, um, you know, the way they are at so-and-so. So I'm going to talk... Um, about this framework for action um, that was released uh, by WHO um, called Strengthening Quality Midwifery Education for Universal Health Coverage. And we talked about proportionate universality this morning, Jackie, and I thought that was really um, important. And the great thing about this was uh, Mary Renfrew, of course, a massive contributor who co-wrote this uh, with us. But this was launched by member states. This was launched by Malawi, Sweden, um, many countries, including our own UK, Chief Medical Officer Sally Davis was there. Um, so, you know, many countries got on board. India got on board with this. So it's really great. It took a long time. But I think at WHO sometimes, when you know that member states themselves want this and they choose one of the four top slots at the World Health Assembly, this got the top, top slot, you know this is something that countries really want our help 
uh, to move forward with. So it's online, so I'm just going to summarise really what it is that's in here and talk about how we can use it and how we can make the opportunity of 2020 uh, to really make this happen. So first of all, often, why education? Come on, we need regulation, we need this, we need that, it's a health systems issue. And before long we find we're talking about everything under the sun and we've lost our entry point to improving quality of care. So all of those issues are important and, and I'll come to them. But really if we think about it, globally 830 women and 7,000 newborns die every day. And that means as we're in this room, you know, that that's what's happening. And if we don't move on this, and somebody said this morning, Leslie, we need to move fast. We can't just sit back uh, and continue to let this happen. And of course, they're dying in the countries where people are poorest, where they have the least resources. Um, we have done at WHO a global educator survey, which will come out next year. And it was extraordinary. First of all, it was the first time we'd ever asked educators anything, you know, what did they think? And I, I can't remember how many countries, but it was all six regions that we covered. And frankly, they don't have the competencies, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the skills, and they don't have the behaviours. And even asking simple questions about the ICM competencies confidentially, so many came back and said, I can't do that. I don't know how to teach care of the newborn. I don't know how to talk about family planning. They just don't know, and they can't teach it. Um, they have almost nothing to teach with, and in India, we have uh, Indy here, and a lot of you have heard things are moving. Um, in Gujarat, which is the, the big the state which is now going to move forward after Telangana state, um, I was there a couple months ago, and the whole Nodal Education Institute, which is one of the best in India, all the educators are fabulous, they had one book, one textbook on obstetrics, not a single other bit of teaching anything. And they're really trying to do the best, but we're not really getting this information out to them. And then huge numbers, 30 to 40 percent of education institutes didn't have a functioning toilet and didn't have running water. How can you teach the basics of infection prevention and control when you can't even use the toilet yourself or shower or wash your own hands? It doesn't then get into your psyche that every day this is what you have to do before and after because you've never had to do it in your education and training. So in a way, we have a real global crisis of education. But if you think of what Florence Nightingale did almost 200 years ago, which was professionalize nursing in St. Thomas's, which led to the professionalization of midwifery, she did so much. And I wonder if we've actually moved it far enough forward. It's there in name, but actually, it isn't actually happening. So we have a huge, huge responsibility at this very special time in midwifery to get this changed and to move it forward. So, as I was saying, we're in a very extraordinary time. We have never before in the history of humankind, as far as I'm aware, been in a place where we have so much over-medicalization, and I really hope this woman needed the cesarean section, and it wasn't just for financial purposes or whatever. And yet we still have this. This is a picture recently taken in Nepal. So, you know, this is quite common. A woman just on a bed, there's nobody there, what's wrong with her, it's filthy. Why are, we, why are we doing this? Why is this happening? Um, and again, you could have taken this photograph 200 years ago, and we think, really? We know, what have we uh, actually done? Um, so we have these two divergent uh, things happening at the same time. <clears throat> and some of you will have uh, known of the Lancet Maternal Health Series in 2016, which said that globally we have far too much happening too soon, too quick to cesarean section, too quick to intervene, but at the very same time, still too little, too late. We, we know what's going to happen to that woman. You know, we're pretty clear what's going to happen there. And then really importantly, I want to highlight a very uh, much more recent report, the Lancet Global Health Commission, brilliantly led by Margaret Crook, who pointed out that poor quality of care is now a bigger barrier to reducing mortality than insufficient access to care. Cast your minds back 200 years, we could have said the same thing. Hospitals were just starting, but the quality was really, really bad. So, you know, we've done a lot to say everyone must have a skilled birth attendant, move everybody into facilities. But if they're like that on the right, or even if they're like that on the left, is that, are we doing the right thing? So just to back that up, this is the evidence <clears throat> on looking at mortality, just last year, to poor quality, and women and other, other people who don't get to health services. And the really staggering facts are here that over 50% of neonatal deaths take place in facilities that don't have good quality of care. So would they have been better at home? 
you know, we, we need to really think. And similarly, it's difficult to see this, but that's just around 50% of maternal deaths taking place in facilities where they lack quality of care. So we have to really rethink now, at 19, you know, 2019, moving into 2020, year of the nurse midwife, are we doing the right thing? And, and Jackie raised a lot of those issues um, earlier. Um, so that was the, the maternal. <clears throat> so thanks to Mary sitting here and her great team of elves and many, many others, <laughs> we now do have the evidence. And um, I came from uh, DFID when I was working in the London office and advising um, our MPs and our Secretary of State. What they wanted was to support midwifery. What we didn't have was the evidence. I could say to the Secretary of State, a bed net to prevent malaria will cost this much. If we invest a million pounds, we're going to save a million lives and it will, it will save this. We couldn't say that about midwifery. We couldn't say how many lives it would save. We couldn't say anything. So it's really extraordinary how important this Lancet series of midwifery has been and the work that, that Mary's led. And I have to say, every country that I work in, whether I'm talking to a Ministry of Health or a head of an office or a UNICEF representative, as soon as you say and give them something that says more than 80% of all maternal deaths, stillbirths, and neonatal deaths could be averted where midwives are educated international standard, that has become the number one part of their speech. And they go, why didn't I know this before? You know, so it's, it is really fantastically transformational. And for WHO, um, you know, who helps set the global norms and standards, we rely a lot on others. We rely on the NICE guidelines, but also this kind of evidence to make sure we can say it. So we mustn't underestimate the importance of the work by people like Mary, Jane Sandal was mentioned this morning, Billy Hunter and her team are here, and all the researchers at this conference. It's really critical. The impact that your evidence, you probably don't know what it is, but in countries where they need this, it's absolutely huge. So that was just phenomenal. Of course, regulation, integration, and particularly interprofessional teams are absolutely critical. This cannot just be a midwife. Many countries don't yet have a midwife. We're moving that way. Many of them are nurse midwives, isolated on their own. They must work in a team with the obstetrician, the pediatrician, often the nurses, the, the health workers, whoever health is there. So we can't just educate. We must license, regulate, and fully integrate into the health system and work in these interprofessional teams. And I think that's something we can really work on next year um, you know, with our colleagues. So um, the Lancet series highlighted very clearly that it's not just birth, and often we find that midwives are seen as birth, you know, a midwife at the birth. But actually, when you look at the Lancet series and all the other outcomes that are improved by midwifery care, this is where we get into HIV and STIs and cervical cancer and psychological support, which, which really looks at our full scope of practice. So um, we worked on this, Mary and I, to try and take very complicated uh, data in the Lancet series to put it into a framework which was around survive, thrive and transform. And that's a new global strategy for women, children and adolescent health up to 2030. Because previously, we'd really focused on survive. A lot of good work on emergency obstetric care. But sometimes at the expense of looking at the whole woman and she was alive, but was she healthy um, and happy? And how can she transform her society and her community if she's just alive? You know, if, how we can move forward. So we put midwifery at the center and we know that mortality is reduced. We know that harm to women and newborn is reduced. We know that there are improved psychosocial outcomes with midwifery. Intervention use is reduced. There's improved public health, breastfeeding, tobacco cessation, all those important things, and improved health service outcomes. So just having midwifery in a country transforms all of those things. And when we think of the many countries, for example, in the Middle East, there is no culture of midwifery whatsoever in those countries, and in parts of Eastern Europe and certainly sub, um, South, Southeast Asia. Um, they're, they're missing this. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but you can see, and please use this uh, a lot, but um, we, we've got you know, reduced mortality, reduced mo serious morbidity, preterm birth, we have that 24% reduction in preterm birth with midwife-led continuity of care. I'll say it again and 100 times, if that was a vaccine, it would be the most invested in vaccine. But because it's kind of lost in this complex intervention called midwifery, we're not getting traction with people. I think we've got to work on that next year. I want lots of investment in that. Um, we've got increased satisfaction with childbirth, which is so important on many uh, reasons, and reduced anxiety in labour, reduced postpartum. 
depression, reduced augmentation of labor, <laughs> cesarean sections, episiotomies. Why on earth are we continuing to do episiotomies? There isn't any evidence except for very rare things. Um, increased spontaneous vaginal birth, increased breastfeeding, the number one first and most important public health intervention ever. And if we've got, you know, to get that right, we need midwifery. Smoking in pregnancy is reduced, and so on. So, re and increased referrals for complications, less time in the ward. So this is a really important slide, trying to bring together all of these things, which would be more than happy for those in the room and listening globally. Take this forward. This influences governments, it influences ministries of health, it influences the way midwifery is taught, um, it influences the way we talk with leadership and empowerment and authority if we have this data. So, very importantly, many, many countries are in a conflict or fragile state, and sometimes we forget that. And again, if we look at those Middle Eastern countries, every single one is a fragile state. Very few people in Somalia, for example, can get out and reach those women during war or, or during a, um, a famine. But the midwives can, and this is a picture of midwives in Somalia who are helping this woman. I'm not quite sure, of course, what's going on, but they've been training midwives in Somalia. And can you imagine the difference it makes um, you know, to women who've had no support ever? And when everything else falls apart, those women are still in the towns and villages and are still working with women. They don't leave, you know, they stay there. Um, we've also had some very big uh, global commitments, um, including the Astana Declaration on Primary Healthcare um, and the, recently a global action plan on the healthy lives of, um, and well-being. And I think, again, we need to get our language around midwifery into these big global discussions um, uh, and debates, and certainly around the humanitarian, fragile, and conflict-affected settings. I used to work for the Red Cross and the Red Crescent and working in Iraq and Somalia and Bangladesh. It's a very male, certainly was, I think it still is, a very, you know, it's men on motorbikes, you know, delivering things. It's actually the women there who save the lives, and it's the women there who provide the family planning and the clean water and the vaccinations for the kids. So I think we have a lot uh, to offer um, from midwifery. So one of the most amazing things about this report is we started off with the evidence. We moved to this second section on what do we all think, and then I'll take you on to the, um, the action plan and what we will do. But I never thought we'd get this. We had, um, I should have pointed out, this is a report led by WHO, but with WHO, UNICEF, um, and the ICM. And we don't always agree on everything. <laughs> but what was amazing is the two or 300 people who took part in this, and many, many more thousands online, came to this consensus, which is the first time we've ever had this at a global level, which is that every woman and newborn should be cared for a midwife, and they should be educated to international standards. That's a dream, but we've agreed it now. We can move forward. And that the title midwife should only be used for providers who are educated to international standards. Now, can you imagine what a difference that would make if instead of calling everybody a midwife, we really call those who were educated to the ICM standards a midwife, and the others would be nurse midwives or assistant midwives or auxiliary midwives, but then women would know who they're getting to care for them. Obstetricians and pediatricians would know who they're working with because they would know what skills that they had. And at the moment, it's a little bit confusing out there. Often it's a cleaner who does the deliveries, and the woman thinks it's a doctor. You know, we'd, it's very, very difficult. But if we could know that every woman called a midwife actually has those standards, we'd really start to be able to measure quality of care and the differences it made. Secondly, and I'm so glad it's already come up uh, today, and I'm, I think it will continue to do so, but leadership, we all recognised in the preparation of this report, we have to change midwifery leadership. We've got to step up to the plate. I think Florence Nightingale's 200th is the catalyst um, for us to do that. Um, and thirdly, we've got to improve coordination between all of us. Sometimes you'll be in a country and we have Indy here doing great work in Telangana. We have Lairdal here. We'll have UNICEF over there. We'll have WHO here. We'll have um, UNFPA. Um, we'll have Japigo. Many save the children. And you know what? We're not coming together. We're not talking together. And we've all got our little projects. And the government is getting confused about what we're doing. And we're not pulling together and doing what Jackie has done in England and brought everyone together and say, this is how we go forward um, in partnership. So those, please take them with you. But these are three uh, globally agreed uh, strategic uh, priorities, which we can really work towards starting now, but moving forward uh, next year. So. <laughs> The other thing, I'm going to quote Mary now, which is this startling lack of investment. It's incredible. It's a bit like the vaccine. We know the evidence now. 
but the lack, of, the lack of investment in midwifery is just extraordinary because we've known about it for centuries. Um, and I have to say, I, I'm a, I am a bit impatient at times. <laughs> there, are, there are times when I'm in these global meetings and people say, oh, my midwife was so nice. Oh, she was so sweet. And you have all these global leaders sitting there. Oh, when I had my midwife. And I want them to stop and say... My midwife was so great, I want other women to have that experience and to survive how I did, and I want to invest X billion dollars in making sure this happens. And, and that's where we need to move, because it's all very nice saying that we're nice, but it's not enough. We need, to, we need, we need the investment. I think we've got to really get kind of hard-nosed about, about the evidence and calling you know, the accountability on that. It reduces costs. We know from many countries, great research in Australia, that, that when you have midwife-led care and the UK and other places, it's actually cheaper but better. And we can't use the word cheaper because that suggests not as good. Um, but it's better quality and then you've got more run money to do other things with. You know, a caesarean section in a developing country absorbs just about every dollar that they have in that hospital. There's nothing left for the toilets and the water or to pay the staff with. It's taken it all. Um, so we've got to really look at it that way. This is a new slide that's just come uh, from... I've just lost the... Um, Thing. It's, it's a global report on universal health coverage that just came out. Um, and this is uh, two years. It, have staff received any training in antenatal care in the last two years? And very few have. You look at Liberia, of course they had Ebola, they've had a civil war, but almost no, less than 10% of their staff have had any updates in antenatal care. Um, Sierra Leone, almost a neighbour, has done much better. But if you look at um, uh, Benin, Burkina Faso, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Zambia, it, there's not much going on here. There's, there's not much happening in investment of education. Um, so that kind of backs up our evidence a little bit more. So we thought, what can we do about this? Um, <clears throat> we're getting good on the evidence. I get emails from country X to say, at WHO, dear friend, could you please send me a curriculum? And it's like, no. <laughs> I don't think that's what we need. You know, I think it's, education is not... Ten sides of paper saying test urine, do antenatal check. That's not, that's not what we need. So, with this incredible group, we put together this action plan, and this is what I really want to talk to you about and how we take this forward. Now, first of all, for this action plan, we put women and newborns at the centre because, of course, it's about midwives, but it's also about all the other people who support midwives: the obstetricians, paediatricians, other care workers, families, communities. And the very first thing, and it's great again that it's come out today, is leadership. In many countries, we don't even know who the government chief nursing midwifery officer is. Elizabeth has done the most amazing job to pull them together, contact them, set up a list. We left them out in the State of the World's Midwifery Report. We did a whole two State of the World's Midwifery Reports without engaging the government chief nursing midwifery officers. Some of them have no desks, some of them have no laptops, some of them have no budget, they don't have a phone, and they're just left sort of sidelined there in name but actually they have no role and function. And I have a very good friend who's the Chief Nursing Midwifery Officer in India. Now, can you imagine in a population of 1.2 billion, is it, um, Indy? She's on her own in the Ministry of Health. She has a PhD. She's a wonderful person. She can't get traction on anything. She's left out of meetings. It's extraordinary how we have undermined that position. So one of the great things we really do want to do next year is get everyone in anything you're doing in any country to go through that government chief nursing midwifery officer and having Jackie as the first chief midwife of England makes such a powerful um, you know, difference. Um, but all around the world they are there, hidden, sometimes they're nurses, it doesn't matter, they're there to help us as part of the team. Um, so, um, and, and get your policy right. I'm going to go into detail on these so I mustn't get drawn into talking about each. Then we've got to get the evidence. And um, in India and other countries, I'm going to come back to that, getting this evidence on your mortality. Is it HIV that's driving the maternal mortality? If it is, that's what your midwives need to focus on. Is it malaria? That's what your midwives can do. Is it infection? That's what we need to do. You know, we really need to understand what's driving the maternal newborn mortality, mortality and get some baselines. Then we need to talk to women. We talked about that this morning. We need to talk to parliamentarians and so forth and other professionals. Then we need to get our educational institutes ready, the practice setting and the clinical mentors, uh, because in many places they're not. Then we strengthen the faculty, bring them in to, to start setting those standards in the curricula, and then we educate. So the curricula comes later. 
And really importantly, and I'll come on to this later, we've got to get much better at monitoring, evaluating, reviewing and adjusting because I'm still stuck in how do I tell DFID what the economic investment in midwifery is. I, I don't have it. It's very difficult to find. I can say, we, so in, this organisation trained 3,000 midwives. So what? You know, what's changed other than we have 3,000 midwives? What has been the impact? What did it cost? Um, all of this within the global strategy for women, children, adolescents is about ACT. It's about monitor and review, so we have a continuous cycle. So th this is a whole new approach to strengthening education. Any country, whether it's Australia, Sweden, Guinea-Bissau, Malawi, any country, wherever you are, can take this. So I'm just going to um, go through them briefly. It's all, of course, online and in here. But when we look at the leadership, we find it's very fractured in countries around midwifery. Some is with the obstetricians, some is with the nurses who often don't talk to the midwives. We've got to pull that together. Next year's our big opportunity. What's been amazing in the countries where they have strengthened and set up a new or started a national midwifery task force. Now, when I was in the ICM, brilliant ICM Africa regional meeting in Namibia a couple of months ago, every single African country there said, we're going to go and set one of those up. You know, whether, it doesn't matter whether you're a midwifery association or from the government or from a UN agency. They were saying, this is what we need to do. Because then you bring everybody around the table in a room and you start planning. You get your, your subgroup on evidence, the subgroup on the curriculum, the subgroup on various other things. Um, and then you get to look at your policy. Can midwives give intramuscular injections? If not, you must change that. Many countries, they can't. How on earth can they give uterotonics if, if that doesn't happen? So... Um, Next one. Here we go. A little bit. I'm just going to dwell a bit on this one, Mary. I'm probably going a bit over. Um, but we really wanted to look at leadership. And the big question when I came to WHO is, oh, why are midwives providing such poor quality of care? Why can't they do a good job? It was all our fault, of course. You know? um, and so we had this brilliant intern who was a midwife who's now become an obstetrician, by the way, um, because she couldn't stand what was happening anymore. But we looked at what are the social, economic and professional barriers preventing midwifery personnel in low and middle income countries from providing quality of care to mothers and newborns. We really wanted to know why. I won't go through all the details. It was a systematic mapping, no language etc. And we came up 9,126 to 82 items and then it got uh, published in plus one. And following the results of that, we thought, okay, we combine them. I'm going to show you combined results. Actually, what do midwives think? Why can't they? So we did this survey and we thought we'd get a couple of hundred responses. And within a couple of weeks, we had two and a half thousand responses. And we had to close it because everybody wanted to say something. 93 countries, four languages, Again, with help from ICM and the White Ribbon Alliance. That was the midwives' realities. And this is what we came up with. 37% of midwives have suffered harassment, fear, violence, or live in unsafe accommodation. That's pretty bad. Who wants this job? This one, 53% of African midwives feel disrespected by their medical colleagues. I showed this in um, Senegal two weeks ago in a room of 21 countries and about 150 people and went absolutely silent. There were four midwives in the room and all the rest were medical colleagues. And it was like, Oof, is that really what they feel? Um, and this was just from a very simple survey that we did on, on SurveyMonkey, with, with the help of, of many people. So when we talk about leadership and we talk about 2020, I just, we pull this together from all the results because I think we have to think more broadly about what is, what is the problem. And we came up with three areas. Some of you have seen this before. But the first one really is a deep-rooted socio-cultural history, actually, um, which is that care at birth is considered women's work. In many countries, there's the dye, the traditional birth attendant. It's dirty work. Touching menstrual blood or the placenta is dirty. So you get the untouchable, you get the illiterate, to come at birth and clean up the mess. It's not about caring for the woman. And in other cultures like, like our own in Europe, it's often until Florence professionalised everything. You know, these were illiterate women um, uh, who, who didn't know. And... There's been a huge lack of acceptance of midwifery as a profession, rapidly changing now in India, but it's going to take a long, long time. Um, transgression of accepted gender roles, so in Afghanistan, for example, fantastic midwives have been educated and trained, but the communities don't like them to be out there on their own as women. They should be at home, cooking, 
with the children. And they're very, very vulnerable to physical and sexual assault. Pretend you're in Nepal walking from one Himalayan village to the other. The birth's gone on late, it's two o'clock in the morning. What are you doing as a woman out at night if you're not providing sexual favours? You know, it's very, very difficult for them. The second area that we really need to look at is the economic side. It's, we know this, but it became very clear in this that infrequent wages, I've been in Guinea-Bissau, they haven't been paid for six months. Six months. They can't feed their children, they can't feed themselves, and yet they're expected to work really hard. Um, and they can't even cover their rent or their food, and they have no safe accommodation. Often they'll share the latrine with the night guard. They're very, very vulnerable. Um, and they, most of them have to take a second job. They're farming or they have, a, have another job. They're exhausted. And then thirdly is the one we classically look at, which is this professionalism, the lack of investment in education regulation, very weak professional autonomy. They, they can't practice their scope of work. And medical hierarchies that constrain the scope of practice. And, and I think we're all familiar with that. So then we have a gender penalty from the low so social status of women in midwifery. We have that midwifery is feminized. It's a women's work, so it's not professional and not valued. And then we have this moral distress, as it's described, and burnout, leading to poor quality of care. And I, you know, I've been to places where there's a woman hemorrhaging, and they're just standing like that. And you think, for heaven's sake, what can you do? You know, why? Why? They're totally burnt out. They can't do anything. Um, and where does it all come from? We track back, track back. It's all about gender inequality. And I do think for 2020, we've got to put the gender issue right up on the forefront. And we had a recent meeting in Geneva of uh, nursing and midwifery leaders. And gender was the big issue that they all wanted addressed next year. How, and that's difficult. How do we address that? So I'm just going to go quickly now. I've already spoken a little bit about a lot of it, and I'm probably going to just have to rush through this. Um, but getting your baseline data, I'm moving to the number two, is really important. What skills do your staff have? What skills do your educator have at the beginning of something? And how do you measure how much money you put in to improve that, to demonstrate change, to get greater investment? Um, we need to align with in, existing indicators and use all the data for the other things. Um, Mary's going to talk about this this afternoon, but I just want to talk, say that in this fantastic Lancet series of midwifery, look at the top right-hand corner of medical obstetric neonatal services. 80% of all resources over the last decades have gone into that top right-hand corner, which means less than 20% for what is defined as midwifery. We need to reverse that. Um, this was put up this morning um, by Jackie. I just want to point out two things that this profound impact of midwife-led care is something we've got to keep talking about because it hasn't quite got in to the, the non-midwife research discussion in many, many countries. And this 24% less likely to experience preterm birth is a really big headline. It's preterm birthday coming up soon. We all need to shout it from the rooftops and not just to each other, but to our pediatricians and policymakers. And then secondly, this whole business that it improves women's experience of care. Um, and there's many other fantastic things in there, but I won't dwell on that. But thanks so much to Jane Sandal and all of the people who did that work. Just want to point out that we've used this evidence into the WHO guidelines. So midwife-led continuity of care, for example, thanks to Sue Down and many others who work on this, is now mainstreamed into the WHO recommendations on antenatal care, postnatal care, uh, uh, intrapartum care, um, and we're updating those postnatal care guidelines at the moment. Uh, but you'll see it's now about a positive childbirth experience. So the language in WHO is beginning to change. The focus on midwife-led care is there. Um, there's much more about um, respect and dignity coming out. It's becoming less obstetric and more midwifery, basically. So we need to make sure everyone listening you know, internationally, please access this. They're all free and they're all online. Then with public engagement and advocacy, again, I mentioned it, but we've got to get evidence-based advocacy. Just to be nice is not enough, and to say midwives matter is great. But how? What is their impact? Align our national consensus. Women's group, parliamentarians, professional associations, they've got to come on board. We can't do this alone. We need to build everybody's engagement. Um, the preparations of institutes, I think people in this room are much better educators than I've ever been and have got much more experience. But we've really got to engage senior managers and establish mechanisms to get our national standards met and assess our practice settings. I'm trying to move this one. We've got to do much more to improve our capacity of midwifery educators and update the curricula to international standards. Honestly, sometimes I get five or six pages of scrap 
and that's what it's been for the last 30 years. It's not good enough that that's still happening now. It really, really isn't. Um, and the ICM did this incredible job in India. Um, Leslie Page is into the room, but she was one of the team, to write a whole transformational midwifery curriculum in India, which of course has been now adapted by the Indian Nursing Council and the Indian government. But I'm encouraging them. This is a fantastic new global curriculum that could be adapted to many countries, looking at a really transformational methodology of education and thinking. Um, so we have a lot to do on that. Uh, we've got to then educate accelerate our provider capacity, strengthen competencies. It's more than skills. Many donors want to do skills and drills, skills and drills, skills and drills. <laughs> Much more than that. They've got to have the evidence to be empowered. They've got to have the ability to provide the care, and they've got to have the right behavior. They've got to be able to go online, use the apps, etc., and integrate theory and practice. Many places you have theory classroom, you have a skills lab, and then you have somebody in a ward, and they don't talk, meet, or share a curriculum or anything. It's totally separate. Um, and then, I won't go through this, this is a whole thing, but monitoring and evaluation, we have got to get better in terms of leadership at this. Put 10% of your budget to monitoring your programme, develop that monitoring plan alongside the whole, the whole, all of it, and have your logical framework of objectives, activities, indicators and costs so you can prove to donors what you've achieved and get more money. Otherwise, we, we're not really going to, to move. Now I'm going to, that's, it, that's the end of everything. On, on the framework. Mary, have I got a couple of minutes just to finish off with? You've got 10 minutes. 10 minutes. That includes questions. Questions. So, yeah. so we've had a, a super talk by Elizabeth and others about 2020 in the 72nd, the, you know, the seat of power. So 194 uh, ministries of health agreed unanimously. I don't think anyone needed persuasion. Everyone's been waiting for this moment um, that it's 2020 International Year of the nurse and the midwife, and of course, 20, 200 years since Florence Nightingale. And I'm just going to put this up because I think we need to laugh. I love Florence Nightingale. Okay, so have we made progress? If she was in the room today at this conference, what would she think? And what she said, we don't know the date, but please read her biographies. They are absolutely incredible if you haven't. No man, which I like, <laughs> not even no woman, not even a doctor, ever gives any other definition of what a nurse should be than this, devoted and obedient. This definition would do just as well for a porter. It might even do for a horse. It would not do for a policeman. So you have to think in the context, the horse was so important. But, you know, we're not, you know, I, I, her sense of humour was incredible. I think we should keep quoting Florence, actually. I really do. Um, and then I'm going to, my, just my final thing is, some of you know about Holly McNish. And um, internationally, if you haven't heard of her, please go and read her stuff. She is so pro-midwife and her whole experience of a young mother not ready for childbirth. Her stuff on breastfeeding just makes me tingle. So I just thought I'd read this out because I, I want to say that this is hard work, what we're doing. Things are tough out there, but actually we are appreciated. And um, you know sometimes we don't always feel that in the environment that, that we work in. And so this is Holly on a train and even the first line just made me laugh. She was sitting on a train and she says, sometimes I lie. And I say I'm a midwife when strangers on a train ask what I do. I want them to think I'm good. I want them to look at my hands and imagine those hands have held more than a pen. I want them to think I've run between bedsides, mermaid to ships, carrying sailors to safety on shores, delivering life or toast or condolences, comforting those in the midst of an earthquake, sewing stitches in skin like life-saving tapestries, sitting for seconds catching breath between screams. So if you ever feel you're not appreciated, just look at Holly McNeish. I think she's absolutely brilliant. And that's a thank you for me with a tapestry that was made at the um, WHO Collaborating Centres meeting, uh, where some of us were there um, in Cairns, in Aboriginal part of Australia. And these were Aboriginal art artists who put the placenta at the centre with all the lines going out and the hands and there's volcanoes and kiwis and all sorts of things. But you know, for them, midwifery was an art and a science and deeply rooted um, in the culture, and we, we really mustn't forget that. So thank you very much. No, thank you, Fran. What a lot of ground you covered in such a short time. We've got about 10 minutes left for questions. I know Fran is keen that we think about moving forward. She's thrown some big challenges into the room about mm -hmm. leadership about physical infrastructure, just water and sewage, never mind anything else, and about education, for example. So the floor is yours. There's you know, lots of experience right in this room 
and yeah. uh, we'd love to hear your questions and suggestions around tackling some of those really big themes into the future. Who would like to ask a question? Um, thank you for a great presentation, very comprehensive. Um, I just have a question to you because I feel that a lot of midwives will say, you know, there's not enough resources, they're pressurized. Um, a lot of the politicians will say, oh, there's not enough budget for the health systems, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et so I just wonder, who do you envision being central to pushing this agenda forward? Mm -hmm. Is it the women themselves? to kind of raise these issues? Mm -hmm. Is it the midwives? Is it the politicians? Obviously, you will say all of them, mm. but who's perhaps most central to this change? Mm. I, I think that's a really, really good question, and it's, it's a leadership question too. A, a word I haven't used is economist, because we tend to leave out the economists, um, and they are very, very influential in ministries of finance. Um, so again, you know, with, if we're doing this on a national scale, it is government leadership, the government chief nursing midwifery officer, but they need the economists um, on their side to work to get this financial data out. It's very difficult to get, particularly in low-income countries. Um, so we, we need the economists to, you know, to work with us, and I think the investment case that's going to be done for the next State of the World's midwifery report is going to be very influential um, in terms of evidence-based advocacy, but also in terms of methodology, um, and, and how we do that. Um, and, and then we need the media and the advocacy. You know, if, if the headline of the Daily Mail was, um, you know, not what's going on if we do such and such, but, you know, midwives will save X million a year, um, you know, in, in any country, um, you know, that's a, that's a really important part of advocacy. So economists and media plus women, um, but it has to be organised. Again, it has to be brought together. Um, so I hope that's helpful. It's not an easy thing. Any more questions? Over here. Do you mind standing up when you speak? And say where they're from. And say yeah. where you're from and, yeah. and yeah. just remembering there's an audience out there watching as well as the people in the room. Okay, hi, I'm Maureen Collins and um, I'm currently a, a, a midwifery consultant and a hypnobirthing teacher. I was the previous head of midwifery with one-to-one -one midwives. Um, um, my question really, I suppose, is more about the UK. Um, we made the change. We uh, delivered care to 17,000 women over eight years. We achieved half the stillbirth rates. We achieved the lower section rates. So we achieved the outcomes that were being told that actually reflect in the Lancet and the World Health about yeah. midwifery-led care, continuity of care. We achieved all of that, but now we're gone. Mm. So my question is, how do you sustain it? What is, because there is a political and a financial mm. landscape out there. Mm. So how do you sustain those models? Because we could not be sustained. So how do you do that? Mm. That's my question. Thank you. Do you want to try, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I, think, I think it's a great question. Yes, yeah, so um, do I. I, really I. I mean, this is, for you, it's a UK-specific question. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's a global, it's a global question, question because there are examples across the world of really great things happening and then mm -hmm. they don't continue. There are no magic solutions. You know that because you defend them if there were because you have worked so hard well, on this. Sorry, I think we do have good leadership mm. in, in Jackie, and I do think we have good leadership mm. at a certain level. But then when you come down to the leadership in, in uh, trusts and uh, regulation and CQC, I don't think we have adequate leadership. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. I also think our good leadership is relatively recent. And I think what we have is a very long-standing embedded problem that runs right through society, not just the health service. And so Franz just mentioned economists and the media, and absolutely, absolutely, mm. absolutely. If you'd had an economic analysis of your service, do you know, it would have been a bit of a no-brainer. If the media hadn't been the way they currently are in the UK, which is kind of, you know, antagonistic to um, the whole kind of... Um, countries. Uh, 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 Midwife-led care to breastfeeding to um, norm the normality agenda, for example, um, then I think the story would have been quite different. So actually, I think the answer Fran gave just now was a really good one. It's about that alliance that brings the political leadership. And I think we now have leadership in good places, but it needs time to dig down and get traction right through the whole system. But I'm sure Jackie's got a better answer than I have. No, I, I totally agree. But um, 
In, in addition, I think, having lived and breathed um, uh, the demise of some of our great midwives and their ways of working that's commensurate with our national policy, what has been missing is that alignment and that synergy and that infrastructure that will keep businesses safe. Mm -hmm. um, from all the way uh, from the top of the NHS, approved and agreed through um, robust financial um, sign-off and modelling right through to the CCG. So the safety net is so tight in terms of governance, in terms of finance, in terms of contracts that we never, ever have this situation again in England. And, and I think if I may, you know, if we look at other countries globally, um, you know, that they're facing such difficult problems. It is a question of do we build a road or do we invest in... Um, in midwives, and, and I, I think half the population are women, and I think they have to have a voice here and demand the services. And we haven't always really listened to women in the way that we could have, but where we have, it's made a very big difference. Maybe. Jenny. Um, Jenny Hall, I've been in education for uh, far too many years. Um, but I... It broke my heart actually listening to what you said and what, what you had there because it's very clear we have inequality across the world and we've known that, I mean it's a silly thing to say but we have inequality in, in so many ways but in education we have a clear inequality but in this country as I, as I have been going through my career and watching what has been happening to midwifery education in this country, there is inequality in this country mm -hmm. between the different um, universities that are, are carrying out education in different parts of the country. And a midwife in, in certain parts of the country might get a different experience than actually being a, a student at somewhere else. And I'm sure that this is the same across universities in um, more developed countries as well. And this is because they are big businesses. And that they, however much you are talking about, it's political, we need to, to arrange you know, yeah. what is right for, for education, yeah. is that actually there's a control on education by universities who have the power with the money. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, the midwifery departments are shrinking um, because there has been lack of funding, as, as Mary has, has pointed out previously, that funding in education for midwives has been very poor, and because they're small departments, those money is being taken away. Mm. There's very, very little evidence and research that has been carried out by midwife educators on what is the best way of actually teaching mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. or facilitating learning in students. We have some people who are, who are looking at virtual reality, for example, but that will not feed into Africa, possibly, because what they need are more sort of the grassroots resources. Now, I'm obviously going off on one here, but, but what I want to say to you is what can we do as midwife and midwife educators to start sharing our resources better so that we're not reinventing the wheel? which is putting, you know, an awful lot of money and effort is being put into reinventing the wheel yeah. the whole time, whereas actually we have the resources there and how can we then take it forward in all of our countries, in all of our places, without having to go through all this politics that we have in certain yeah. um, universities who say, right, well, you can't do that within our particular setting. I mean, I can ask so many questions, but <laughs> that's, that's where I'm going to stop for a minute. If, if I may, just, just to respond to that, um, I think it's a really important point. In, in, in some countries, it will be the universities. In many, many countries, there's far much more private sector education and training of nurses and midwives, completely unregulated. And these really are businesses. And so with that standardisation of education and, and you know, regulation, uh, and, you know, the lack of regulation is stunning. Uh, people are coming out qualified, you know, quotation marks, but but actually without having attended a birth or cared for a woman, you know, and, and I, but we have to be very careful because the private sector is so incredibly important to be able to move forward. So again, it's that leadership of making sure that the government sector, private sector. 
On the issue of sharing resources, again, I'm going to say it again, 2020 is going to be fantastic. We live in a world where we can put things on apps, where we can all have everything like this incredible IME, which can go out online. There's no reason we can't put our resources out there you know, for others and for countries that don't have the privileges that many of us do in terms of our education materials. What's the harm in sharing your, what, what it is you teach and, and how you teach it? And finally, on the research about education, I couldn't agree more. Um, there's a lot of stuff about, you know, we know how to teach and this works best. It, we don't find in WHO actually that we do know. And there's a big piece of work going forward now on what is the best way to teach people in low resource settings to ensure that they not only have the skills, but they have the knowledge and the empowered by knowledge, plus have the right behaviours. It's, it's a tough one. Good point. Last question, because it's going to be lunchtime any minute now, so thank you. Sorry, Grace, unless it's something very... My important. name is Susan Oradian, and I'm actually in communication, but working with Safe Motherhood. And I'm really concerned about Lancet's decision that quality of care is more important than access. And I would like to share with you that in the developing world, or in Africa that I know, it was incredible. In the last 20 years, the midwives basically have saved the lives mm. and they've reduced the maternal mortality ratio by a third mm. in places where you would think it'd be impossible to do it at all. But the remaining women are underserved, poor, non-literate or mild, low literate in communities where everybody else is poor, non-literate and low literate. And they are not going to get to the emergency care that you're providing mm -hmm. if I think it's only the midwives who can help make governments and politicians and decision makers understand that we have to have the communities bring, evacuate women in need. Mm -hmm. The communities have to do it because in low resource settings, ambulances are a joke. And the idea that everybody is two hours from a hospital is ridiculous. Because in a village, there's a lorry that comes once a week. And women give birth 24-7. So I'm counting on the midwives in adding another responsibility to your responsibilities. Because you know what it's like when women come too late. Thank you. Thank you. Point. I think I, I don't think there's any dispute about what you just said. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you again to Fran for just such a helpful, helpful talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>